Here is Cascade Green. This color is a weird one. I got it early on, had it in my palette, and just never used it. It just, the name enthralled me. It's Cascade Green, and I live near the Cascades, and I was so excited at the possibility of like, oh, this is a perfect color for my landscapes. It just does funky, funky stuff. So it's a mixture of phthalo blue green shade plus brown iron oxide. And it tends to settle out. So when you do it in more wet washes, and hopefully I can get it to happen here in the little bit lighter patch of it, it'll just, the phthalo blue runs, you know, it isn't, um, is non-granulating where the lovely earth tone mixed with it is granulating. So the two settle out and you get this like, sometimes a really, really dramatic like line of, you know, blue along a blooming line with yet kind of orangey brown next to it. So it hasn't become a staple. And then unfortunately when that settling out happens, it goes from a pretty organic kind of nice looking green to being kind of artificial in that separation state. So it's one I have but have not touched for a long time. Up next is Jadeite Genuine. This one is cool because right at first it is lifting right off of that paper much more nicely than any than the other ones have. I think of the Primatech colors I've tried, this was the easiest to re-wet aside from sodalite. It's also the darkest in value aside from sodalite as well. So of these greens, this is the only one, or of the Primatex, this is the only one that I've tried so far that I would actually consider buying. I don't know if I would because I feel like I can mix that color green again pretty easily, especially with quinacridone gold and a different blue. But once it dries, I'll compare it to some of my green mixtures to just to see out of curiosity what it looks like and how it behaves, you know, differently from drying versus wet. But that one's kind of cool. I'm, I'm intrigued by that one. Like, am I intrigued enough to buy a little five milliliter sample tube? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Have not yet decided. Um, it is very granulating though, and I'm trying to kind of put some more paint in there to try to get more of that granulation to happen, and it's cooperating with middling. <laughs> not too much cooperating with me, so we'll just let that one dry and see how that one goes. Ooh, next up is Viridian. So this one, just like a couple other ones, is very hard to get off of a dry swatch. This is a historic pigment. It was used by some of kind of the great masters in watercolor like John Singer Sargent. And, but it does really need kind of patience, just like I'm doing here, kind of patient re-wetting if we don't use it right out, right out of the tube. It takes a lot of effort to get it to be agitated. And I'm getting frustrated enough with that little swatch, I might move to my bigger palette. And you can see the same thing here, even with more paint to work with, it still just takes a lot of effort to get that color to show up on my paper. Okay, so I was able to get a somewhat dark swatch of Viridian, not that much. It does thin down to a very, very light pale green, which can be really fun to use. You could kind of get a similar-ish color by using a very, very diluted mixture of phthalo green uh, blue shade. But to be honest, there are some, just a couple instances where I really wanted Viridian. Most of them were in paintings for the desert where I wanted that very kind of lovely granulation that that color does much better than other paints. So that's been kind of the main instance that I've used it. I don't use it as much in the Northwest because it's just too granulating for like lakes and that kind of thing. But I have used it more than I thought I would. And I was very excited to have it in the desert. It is just the perfect color for some of those crazy kind of um, different layers of like mudstone or some of the rock and sand over there or sediments, it's just so perfect and like it covers that color spot on. So for that reason, I'm really glad that I got it. Next up is Diopside Genuine. This is another Primatech color. There we go, we can see the palette again. And let's see here, Me, Nothing too special at first glance about this one. There's a lot of Primatech greens, which I guess makes sense. There's a lot of semi-precious and precious gemstones in that spectrum. I feel like I could mix this color myself, so I'm not too excited about it. It is not getting very dark on this paper. It's getting darker on the blotting paper that the colors are on, but not doing much over here on my piece. Thinned out, doesn't look that much different. Nothing too exciting or fancy with that one right there. And last for this page is going to be Thalo Green Blue Shade. Here we go. And just right off the bat, you can see with like three brush strokes, this color is just ready to party. It's so, so vibrant. And to be honest, this is just a color that is so strong and so artificially green. Like you just don't see that color green really in many places in nature, maybe in like the deepest, most illuminated corner of a glacier would I see that color. 
as a result, this is one that I pretty much always have to mix with something else. Unexpectedly, it makes some of the most beautiful shadow tones that I have when I mix it with a pink or a purple, so especially quinacridone rose, makes just this stunning shadow color. So I like to use it for that. It's not something I go to too much other than that. Um, but that brings us to the conclusion of this page so far. We still have more greens and a lot more mixed greens to play with next. But what's neat so far is you can also see this cascade green, that settling happened, and that more wet and kind of dilute swatch. So that brown iron oxide is kind of settling over here, and the phthalo blue is kind of being pulled and staining elsewhere in that swatch. Again, that's why I don't like that color. That separation ends up just being a little bit too artificial for my liking. Continuing on now with our greens, we have Prussian green. So this one is a mix of Prussian blue and diarolide yellow. And so when I first agitate this color, ooh, it's a beautiful dark green. Look at that. Um, at first, it looks kind of similar in tone to the way that Cascade Green looked when wet, so that's interesting. Um, but I just don't think I would use this color personally because of those light fastness concerns and that weird unpredictability made that people saw with uh, Prussian Green or with Prussian Blue. And since it has that in there, I just think I would probably avoid this color. It's quite pretty though. I do like the dark color, so I think I'm going to add it to the list of greens that I want to try to mix myself um, from the other colors I currently have in my palette. So Terry Vert, this is going to be a mix. It is Viridian and Brown Iron Oxide. So that's going to be kind of cool. So I'm, this one is just typical to, to Viridian and it is no surprise to me that it would be hard to kind of re-wet re from the paper just because Viridian is such a pain <laughs> in the butt to get re-wet. It just takes so much agitation. So very difficult to get that one off of the off of the palette and on to or off of the dried palette onto the paper. Also hard to get it at a really dark concentration. But it's a very nice earthy color. So I'm gonna be curious to see how that one dries, see if we get any settling between those two granulating pigments. But it is interesting to start. Cobalt Green Pale is next. This one's not a mix. Um, I just so far I have not been that impressed with the ball a bunch of the cobalt colors. This one just feels a lot like a really pale viridian. Maybe it would be, it would be beautiful if I took it out of the tube, <laughs> but it is just not getting any darker concentration than that. So I'm gonna call that good <laughs> with that one. I don't feel like fighting it to try to make it darker. It's barely even showing up on my paper at a low concentration. Cobalt green, this one is a semi-opaque color. It's light fastness of one. It's now a much more kind of greenish, greenish, they're all green. <laughs> it's more of like a kind of typical, like pri not, not primary green, just like a green that you might see in like a, you know, of a crayon when you were younger. You might tell, call this a color green. It's a prettier color green. I don't think I would use the opacity of this one as much. I think I'd prefer to mix my own green, especially one if I wanted a semi-opaque. I could just use a semi-opaque yellow. So, and then it feels similar enough that I could, I feel like I could mix a version of that using some white and some cobalt blue and some kind of yellow. So probably not one. <laughs> I'm not gonna run to the store to go buy that one. But it is a very intriguing color. Of the greens, that's so far been the most, like the one that I've seen that I might be most curious about. So if I couldn't mix it, then I would maybe, maybe look into it. Up next is spring green. So this is going to be an interesting, oh, look at that. That is like highlighter, <laughs> highlighter green. It's so bright. Oh my gosh, that's insane. And this color is in fact a mix of three different colors now. So we're starting to get into some of these kind of, a lot of folks call them convenience green mixtures, which basically means that, you know, instead of taking the time, if it, if it took a lot of time to mix a green ourselves, we can pull it right out of a tube. What that means, however, is that we do have to be careful of what's in those convenience mixtures because some of them will have different mixing properties with other colors, which might make them harder to work with or harder to mix. Um, so just something to be aware of. And some of them will also be less light fast as well due to what they have in them. This one is made from nickel titanate yellow, phthalo green yellow shade, and a yellow that had that long <laughs> benzy something yellow name <laughs> that I don't want to pronounce. So this one should be decently light fast because it has the nickel titanate and the benzamidazole, whatever it is, yellow, both of which have better light fastness. So that's one that like, if I really wanted a highlighter green, 
I don't think I'd bother, honestly, because that color is not that hard to make using like a Hansa yellow medium plus a tiny bit of phthalo blue. Like you can mix that highlighter color using other colors I already have in my palette without having the unpred unpredictable qualities of, you know, these two different yellows that I'm not as familiar with. So personal choice, but definitely not something I think I would mess with necessarily. <laughs> this one, I swear, looks fluorescent. Like it is an insane color. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> this is permanent green light. There's a cat hair in my paintbrush. So permanent green light. This is going to be, yeah, it looks even more highlighter-ish. It's funny because like that color, spring green, felt so crazy green and vibrant and like not even a very natural green color until I put this color down and now I'm like, oh, <laughs> here is the fluorescent highlighter. It may not actually be fluorescent, but it looks almost fluorescent color. And this one is one I would never use. It has Hansa yellow light and phthalo green blue shade. I was doing some extra reading on Hansa yellow light and I'm actually going to be phasing that out of my palette as soon as I finish my tube because in some independent testing done by Bruce McAvoy, he found that in six to eight weeks, he was getting noticeable fading of kind of lighter washes of Hansa yellow light and then in darker kind of mixtures of that color where it was closer to the mass tone of the color he ended up getting uh, a darkening of that pigment. So it was not a light, fast color in his experience in sun exposure. Now keep in mind, the sun, those kind of sun exposure tests are in more direct sunlight, which maybe we won't have our artwork <laughs> in direct sunlight. But for that reason, anything that has Hansa yellow light, I would not use. And his website even cautions strongly against using these kind of convenience mixtures that have that. So with that in mind, like I just will steer clear of anything that has that. So that means that this next mixture as well, I would avoid. This is Thalo Yellow Green, which is a mixture. So you, this one's a mix of Hansa Yellow Light, lo and behold, alongside some Thalo Green Yellow shade. So not one that I would use. It's just crazy yellow. <laughs> it's like you know, a yellower version of the permanent green light kind of. If I thin this one down, we can see that it's just another, I mean, it's a really pretty color, but again, there's so many different ways to make these really bright, vibrant greens that I don't need to use a color that has light fastness concerns. So permanent green, this one is also a mixture of low, again, lo and behold, Hansa yellow light and phthalo green blue shade. So uh, this is again, one I would avoid. It's also just not a color green that I think I would paint with much. It just feels too, too stark. Um, I prefer to use greens that are just a little bit more kind of organic in their formulations, a little bit less crazy, vi bright, and vibrant, unless the landscape calls for it. But in which, in that case, I know I can mix my own using different colors. So I think I'd avoid that one. <laughs> Thalo green, yellow shade. Okay, it's been a while since we have had a single pigment color. So this is Thalo green, yellow shade. We saw this used in a fair number of those convenience mixtures. And that's something I'm always looking out for. So if I see a color that's used a lot in a convenience mixture like some of these, then that will put it on my radar as something that I might want to buy at some point as an option just to expand my palette's possibilities for colors, especially when I see one that has that light fastness of that one number one, which is the best and most permanent colors. So let's see here. And this one, I also had a note that this color, like the other phthalo greens, will have a noticeable drying shift. So what that means is that when it dries, the color will change a tiny bit. So it'll get a tiny bit lighter in appearance. And then this saturation will go down by about 20% is what I read. So just something to keep in mind, you know, and that's one of the fun things about practicing with our colors <laughs> is that it gives us a chance to figure out you know, how the heck do these colors cooperate and what happens when they dry and how different they look when they're dry versus wet. Next up is Hoker's Green. And this is one that is a mix of different colors to make it light fast. So the original actual Hooker's Green pigment that's used, that was kind of the more archival old color, that one was PG8, which was, which was marginally light fast at best. This one now is a mixture of phthalo green yellow shade, Hansa yellow light. So again, I would avoid it because it still has light fastness concerns. It has quinacridone burnt orange and nickel azul yellow. So that nickel azo yellow will help with the light fastness. So maybe it's less of a concern with this one because the nickel azo yellow has excellent light fastness properties. So unless you were really you know, planning to sell a painting with this at high price and really needed that archival quality, you'd probably be just fine. 
but it's like it's pretty <laughs> but I don't think I'd you know change up my palette unnecessarily to, to get it because I can get similar enough stuff from my current setup of colors sap green <sighs> I wanted to love sap green <laughs> I just really did it's like and it's a really pretty green I think of the convenience mixtures it's probably the most useful one at least for the landscapes that I paint because it really does feel the most kind of authentic to you know many of the greens I see when I'm actually out in kind of more springtime landscapes so and it can be kind of tinted down differently by making you know adding blacks or whites to it but it is a mixture so the few times I've tried to mix it with some of my other colors to change the color green I usually do end up with a bit more unpredictable mixtures and I got kind of muddy ones a few times but so far of the different convenience mixes this is probably the only one that I would really see myself getting. And it's a mixture of Thalo Green Blue Shade, Nickel Azo Yellow, and Quinacridone Burnt Orange. Again, so that's going to be a really great suite a really nice light fast colors, so I wouldn't be worried about using that color and then having that thing fade if I left it out on my desk for a while and in direct sunlight. Our next green is Serpentine Genuine. This one's a little bit easier than some of the Prima Tech colors to get agitated off of that page, uh, off that dry swatch. It's just taking its sweet time about it. Um, it's kind of similar to sap green, honestly. Kind of a brownish, slightly brownish yellow looking greenish color. It probably has really interesting and beautiful granulation properties, given that it is one of those Prima Tech colors. So it could be something fun to play with if I really liked this color and wanted it to have more of the properties of a stone ground pigment. So that could be kind of fun. This next color is going to be a fun one. This is Chromium Green Oxide, and this is a single pigment color. So that's kind of cool to see. It's opaque. <laughs> and the minute I wet this color, I was like, that looks like, like camo color or kind of like the green fatigue color that you see in army uniforms. And sure enough, when I went up and read about it on that, again, that Bruce McAvoy's website, he said that this color is very light fast and it actually mimics the infrared reflectance of green plants. So as a result, it's been the principal pigment, he said, in military camouflage paint. In watercolors, this pigment, PG-17, does undergo a large drying shift. So unlike some that lighten, this one will supposedly darken by a fair bit, he said 13%, and it will also lose saturation by 35%. So I'm super curious to see how this one dries. And it's so opaque that when I put it in my water cup, I can see the little pigment particles just swirling around in there. So it's a very interesting color. <laughs> um, but it's pretty drab. And I love the way that um, Bruce described it. He said that, and I say, and it's a quote, he said, it can be evocative in tints or mixtures, but in, in, it is obtrusively drab and li lifeless when you use it full strength on its own, which I think I probably agree with. <laughs> I thought that was just too funny of a description and very apt to not share that full full description with you. Next up is green appetite. Ooh, okay, so this one is another Prima Tech color. And I like it better than Serpentine already because it definitely re-wet really nicely. So that means I could probably see myself having more success with that using it in a dry palette. It also goes darker than even like my sap green was going. So that's really pretty. I'm enjoying this color a fair bit so far. Ooh, <laughs> that's fun. I could I could maybe see myself getting a small tube of that just to play with it and see how it looked and just enjoy working with a different color, especially since I might, I could see myself also replacing sap green with this one. I'll have to do some kind of color mixing tests to see, but that's a really pretty color. I'm curious to see how it will dry. Our next color is Rare Green Earth. This one is proving quite difficult to get off of the page. So that's interesting. And this one was also interesting to me because on further digging, this color, like the pigment that was used in this one, PG-23, is actually named Terry Vert in most other you know, brands. And that's the name of the pigment that's usually referred to. But Terry Vert, we've already seen a mixture of Terry Vert and they don't really look very, so <laughs> And they don't look very similar. So I'm curious also because Terry Vert apparently is a pigment that ha was pretty much like there's not many reserves of it left throughout the world as an earth pigment. And Daniel Smith says that this one is mixed from natural iron oxides. So I don't know if that means that it is in fact made from that kind of rare 
you know, pigment now, so maybe it is. I couldn't find any more useful information on that. It's just not the, I, I don't think I'd buy it. It was a bit, a bit more pricey compared to other colors. And I don't know, <laughs> it just doesn't do that much for me. So we'll see. I mean, it would, I thought that was just interesting that they had Terry Vert was a mixture of colors and this one here is not a mix. So something to keep your mind on or keep an eye on. And look at how that green appetite and that serpentine are drying. They're getting this really fascinating kind of settling where you have the green pigments and you also have some of the kind of brownish stuff appearing in there. So didn't see that coming. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, going to keep an eye on that. I don't know if I would want to work with a color that was that unpre unpredictable in some ways. So we shall have to see how that one dries fully. Next color is Deep Sap Green, another mixture. This one is a mixture of Quinacridone Burnt Orange, again, Hansa Yellow Light, and Prussian Blue. Oh, this is a double whammy of Light Fastness Concerns. So with that Hansa Yellow Light and Prussian Blue, it's one I would skip. I'm also, I'm going to try mixing my own Prussian blue. I have a feeling I might be able to mix it using Indian Throne Blue and Thalo Blue Green Shade. I will report back if I am able to make a nice approximation of that, but I have a feeling it will be pretty close. Our next color is Perlene Green, and this one is, uh, is a color I actually have. I really enjoy this color. I don't use it a ton, but I did find and I did get it for some time I spent on the Oregon Coast. And it's just a really neat color. It's actually listed under the PBK, which is the permanent black pigments. Is it high concentrations? It will appear very, very dark in black. It's hard to get those concentrations unless you're working with it right out of the tube. So just something to keep in mind there. Thin down, this color is going to look you know, very similar to that rare green earth. It'll have a slightly less of kind of a pinky hue. So just something to keep in mind if you're looking for an alternative to rare green earth that might be a bit cheaper, this one could be a good option, but it doesn't have quite the same pinky or yellow cast that that color does. I like this color a lot. It's just very deep green. It's wonderful for cool shadows and it granulates really prettily so you can get some really cool effects with it. The last color on this page is undersea green. And this one is going to be, I bet that this has ultramarine in it. You can tell right away just by how kind of ultramarine tends to make these like lovely, slightly dull green mixtures. And sure enough, this one is quinacridone burnt orange, ultramarine blue, and nickel azo yellow. So given that I've seen nickel azo, nickel azo yellow in so many mixtures, like what, three on this page? That will also put a color on my radar is one that I might buy a small tube of just so I can kind of play with it and see if it would be a nice one to add to the palette, given that it's been used so much <laughs> in these different mixtures. So that's kind of one of the things that's been unexpectedly valuable in this is that I can learn a lot about the really versatile pigments, at least for me, by looking for how much you see them. The other color that we've seen quite a few times in here is this quinacridone burnt orange. We saw it here in undersea green and deep sap green. We saw it in serpent or in a sap green we saw it. And I think that's the main places. So that also is a color I already have. And I'm also super excited to go play with some green mixtures using that because we've seen it just in so many different uh, greens already. We are almost to the end of this first page of our greens. Next up is Zoocyte Genuine. This is going to be a color that is one of those Primatech again. This one looks kind of like a gray green. Meh. I'm not too excited by that one. I think I like perlene green better. So just this isn't one that I personally would use. It's kind of a nice gray. So, and grays aren't that hard to make once you kind of have a map in your head of the color you want and what you need to make it. So I think I would skip that one. Up next is olive green. This one's semi-opaque, light fastness of one. And that makes sense because it has a diarylide yellow, which is Hansa yellow medium by another name ultramarine blue and brown iron oxide. So let's see what, oh, <laughs> it's like a, I like guess a baby poop green. I've <laughs> like, I've heard that described as like, or chartreuse. That's a more fun name for that. So kind of a chartreuse color almost. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, it is what it is. It's not the most beautiful color in the world, but it's, it's a fun color green for where you needed it. Again, you can really see the effect of that ultramarine blue in there. 
And just like we're seeing undersea green, there is some settling out happening of that um, ultramarine and the other colors. So I'll be curious if we get a similar settling out of those pigments in our olive green over here as well. And then green gold. This is going to be a very bright, vibrant, lovely yellow green. But it's funny, I'm starting to be able to kind of see when they're using Hansa yellow light because it just has that crazy luminosity to it. And sure enough, this one's Hansa yellow light, nickel azo yellow light, or nickel azo yellow, and thalo green yellow shade. So hopefully, because it does have that nickel azo yellow, that would improve the overall longevity of green gold. Um, like, I, I want to like this color. <laughs> I think I would probably just buy nickel azo yellow and thalo green yellow shade if I really wanted this and just skip the Hansa yellow light if I could and see if there was a different way to make it. But um, I have a, I bet that with that nickel azo yellow in there, you'd see less of a light shift. I, I may have to do my own color test of that one to see. Oh, this page was so fun. There's so many different beautiful greens. I don't know if I would change my lineup necessarily to add some of these. Some of them are just kind of, a lot of them are convenience mixtures. A lot of them are mixtures that just wouldn't be that helpful because of that light fastness concern with the Hansa yellow light. But there's a lot of, you know, they're beautiful colors. So sap green is definitely one of the prettier ones to me on the page. So even though I don't always use that color in my palette, I may end up keeping it around just for now. 